Welcome to this ANSYS how-to series video. In this video, we'll focus on how to evaluate and interpret plasticity results. Plasticity is an important behavior in many engineering applications, such as cold rolling, metal forming, and many others. In this video, we'll show you how to obtain and validate a stress strain curve when yielding has occurred, how to fix apparent mismatch issues when comparing with the stress strain curve, as well as the difference between average and unaverage nodal values. Ready? Let's go. Plasticity is used to model materials subjected to loading beyond their elastic limit. Metals often have an initial elastic region in which the deformation is proportional to the load. But beyond the elastic limit, a non-recoverable plastic strain develops. We call the elastic limit the yielding point, or surface, and say yielding happens when the stress in the structure reaches the yielding point. Note that stress is a tensor, which means at one specific location, there are actually six stress components. To evaluate yielding, von Mises stress is calculated using different components of the stress, and it is a scalar and can be compared directly with the material yield strength from a uniaxial test. Similarly, we have an equivalent strain measure and it is calculated in a similar manner. Now, upon unloading, an object that develops plasticity will have a permanent deformation. It seems easy to evaluate yielding, as it can be determined by checking the von Mises stress against the yield stress, or by checking whether the equivalent plastic strain value is above zero. But there are some key concepts we need to know for accurate assessment, and ignoring these may lead to inaccurate interpretations. Let's start with this model of a plate with a hole, which is set up and will be the example model for this discussion. It will be subjected to a uniaxial loading. If we look at the material assignment by expanding the material data, we can see that we have a bilinear plasticity model defined. This model has a linear region defined by the Young's modulus and a yield stress, and also a tangent modulus to define the post-yielding plastic portion of the curve. The plate is held at the bottom face, and it's pulled in tension in the y direction with a force of 30 to 40,000 newtons. Large deformation is turned on, as we will expect more than a few percent plastic strain. Plasticity is path dependent, meaning we need to essentially march along the stress strain curve incrementally to achieve the proper results. If we apply all the loading at once, we will end up missing the proper stress strain response. Now, ANSYS has checks to help limit the development of plastic strain, but it is good practice in nonlinear models to specify automatic time stepping and provide a range of substeps or time steps so the solver can adapt as necessary. We specify 50 initial substeps, 25 for the minimum, and 500 for the maximum. Okay, let's run our model and have a look at the results. The first thing we do is to plot the equivalent or von Mises stress. If we modify the legend with 280 megapascals, which is our yield stress, as the lower limit for the red color band, then everything showing red will indicate yielding has occurred. Notice it's not very smooth as we started with a very coarse mesh. Let's also look at the plastic strain. We see from the chart at lower load levels, we have zero plastic strain but then it builds up with increasing loading. Now, we will plot the stress strain curve at the point of the model, and we can compare the response to our input curve. Let's pick this node at the edge of the hole where we have the stress concentration, push the end key as our shortcut key, and we'll get a dialog box to create a name selection to that node. We'll assign a name, in this case, node of interest. Now create a von Mises stress at this node by changing the scoping method to name selection. Then in the name selection box, you select the name we just specified. Let's repeat this procedure again for the equivalent total strain. Note 
Note that the equivalent total strain is the sum of the equivalent elastic plus equivalent plastic strains. We choose total strain as it will be comparing to our input material curve, which in this case is equivalent stress versus total strain. Now that we have these results at the same node in that model, let's make a chart. Press Ctrl and select both the stress and strain results, then pick the chart icon. For the x-axis, we wish to show strain, so let's change the strain, then we'll turn off the display of time as well as all other quantities except the stress max. Now we have our stress versus total strain curve and zoom in on that region. We see something interesting. We notice an apparent mismatch of the stress above the input stress strain curve. So why do we see this? To answer this question, let's look at a portion of the mesh and explain. Finding element-derived quantities such as stress and strain are computed at the integration points of the element. If the material response is fully elastic, meaning no plasticity has occurred, then they are extrapolated to the nodes using the element shape functions. So why is there extrapolation to begin with? With values computed internally at the integration points away from the corner or nodes, extrapolation gives us the value at the nodes which we can visualize since a node is visible part of our mesh. But if any portion of the element is experiencing plastic straining, the value is not extrapolated, but instead it is copied to the node. So this apparent mismatch we see is because the stress at the integration point is just below the yield point. So the extrapolation is permitted and the extrapolated stress at the node apparently exceeds the yield stress. Okay, so how do we eliminate this? Well, if we go back to our model and have a look at our mesh, again, it's very coarse. A coarse mesh in a region with high gradients, like the hole in our plate, means we'll have a large gradient over the element. And extrapolation over that large field can be quite large. We can see this by plotting the stress results for a single element. Notice the large gradient across the element. Here, we have a finer meshed model that has sufficiently small elements around the hole to capture the gradients. We solve the model, we look at the stress versus total strain again. Let's zoom into the yield region like before, but this time we'll notice the absence of the apparent mismatch. Now as a simple check, let's compare our stress strain curve with our input curve we specified in the material model. If we take a close look, we can see that beyond the yield stress portion of the curve we're just looking at, we see our curve fall slightly below the specified input material curve. So why do we see this type of apparent mismatch? Recall our discussion about calculating stress or strain values at the nodes. If one node is shared by multiple elements, then there are multiple values at the nodes. We can either average them or leave them unaveraged. So if we average, we take these values and we compute an average. If we leave as unaveraged, then we end up with multiple values at the nodes. Since the default behavior is to average the values at the nodes, it is possible that a neighboring element with a lower stress value will bring down this average. And hence, we see the stresses falling slightly below the input material curve. So how can we correct this? We change the integration point results display option to unaveraged. Now we'll be showing the maximum value from the elements that connect to that node. Another case where we'll find that we do not accurately capture the plasticity response is if we force too few substeps. Recall earlier, we recommend setting the automatic time stepping to be turned on and a range of substeps specified. But what happens if we force too few substeps? Let's run this time with auto time stepping turned off and just five substeps. Running the model and looking at the stress strain curve, we see the apparent mismatch as we fall below the yield stress. Plotting our curve against the input curve, we can see this behavior. Our data point beyond yield does lie on the curve, but we've missed a good portion of the curve around the yield stress. Since plasticity is path dependent, we should avoid solving with such few substeps. Finally, it can be useful to report the stresses or strains along a path to see how they vary leading up to a critical location, like a fillet or a hole. Let's go to Model, then Construction Geometry, then pick Path. 
Now we pick our node icon and select a node away from the hole and apply it for our start location. Now we repeat for the node on the edge of the hole. Now we insert stress von Mises, change our scoping method to path, and then pick the name of the path we just created. Set the display time to 0.1 before we have any yielding. The stress along that path is contoured and shown in the graph. Notice the classic stress concentration distribution that results. Now change the display time to 1 where we have our full load applied and reevaluate the results. Here we see a much different stress distribution with the metal plasticity as compared to before with just the elastic solution. We start to get a closer to gross section yielding as the region of the plate with stress above yield is now significant. Continued loading would result in yielding across the entire section of the plate with the hole. So let's summarize. Setting the legend to have the yield stress as the lower bound can help give indications as to what regions of the model are yielding. We can compare our results at the point to the input stress strain curve by plotting the equivalent von Mises stress versus the equivalent total strain. Apparent mismatch of the stress strain results can occur and we indicated why and how to correct them. Finally, making a path plot can help understand the stress and strain distributions leading up to stress risers where plasticity can be common. If you find this video helpful, please like, comment, and subscribe. To find more information about plasticity or other topics, check our channel for more how-to videos and visit ansys.com courses today.